has been uh, interesting uh, me for uh, almost 10 years now. Uh, I've been uh, at the OECD as chief statistician from 2001 to 2009. And uh, in that uh, position, I had the opportunity to deal with this movement, actually, if I don't want to be too strong, to build that movement that led to the Stiglitz Commission, which in fact the idea came up in an Italian restaurant in Paris. Uh, uh, and we were talking about happiness and well-being. Of course, we were in the right place to do that. <laughs> Uh, I paid the deal, I think, but this was, was okay. And that led then to the uh, Stiglitz Commission, but uh, I'm very pleased to be here uh, with you because uh, in October 2012, the fourth OECD forum on, uh, o on statistics, knowledge, and policy will be held in Delhi. I initiated that series in 2004 and, uh, for example, in the 2009 forum in uh, Busan, in, uh, uh, in South Korea, we had uh, 2,000 people from all over the places. Um, and, in fact, the, this, this discussion beyond GDP and so on started in Palermo in 2004 and uh, is still going on very well. But I, I don't want to talk uh, really today about uh, these measures of well-being uh, and so on. I want to focus on what you are trying to do uh, because it's very interesting, uh, uh, although very complicated, and maybe it would be important also for students here to uh, understand where we stand at international level. I'm currently uh, chairing uh, the UN Statistical Commission for the uh, European and North, Afri North, North American uh, region, but India is part of this as a, uh, as a host, uh, as hosted, uh, sorry, uh, invited country. So we, uh, I would like to, to focus on several things that are going on around the world that you can benefit from them in your particular effort. But let me go back uh, to um, a personal uh, uh, case. When uh, several years ago I was invited by the Italian uh, Confindustria, the Industry Association, we were discussing the so-called Bolkenstein uh, Directive about the openness of the market, and we were talking about the Lisbon strategy. So I took the floor, just reading, and I'm going to read it again, what was the aim of the so-called Lisbon strategy that was adopted by the European Council in year 2000 and as a target 2010. Its aim, I'm reading Wiki, Wikipedia of course, uh, its aim was to make uh, the EU the most competitive and dynamic knowledge-based economy in the world capable of sustainable economic growth with more and better jobs and greater social cohesion by 2010. Now, we know very well that this didn't happen, but at that time we were still hoping to make it happening. So I said, uh, okay, um, using uh, an Italian or uh, Roman expression, yes, but the strategy is based on the idea that a knowledge-based policy could, to, could transform a sluggish economy into the most dynamic. So I said, uh, knowledge de che, uh, in Italian, knowledge of what? Why should knowledge transform so radically a, um, a continent like Europe? And I, I think that this question is still before us, because just to use uh, a stereotype, uh, Italians know very well a lot of things. For example, how to evade taxes. Is this the type of knowledge that you are looking for? I don't think so. But it's just to say that saying knowledge doesn't help us very much. So I would like to try to, to get into the story a little bit, making reference 
to what's going on uh, uh, around the world in measuring knowledge and not only knowledge. But before doing that, let me make reference to a second personal case. When I was a chief statistician of the OECD, in 2002 we had a conference in London about, among other things, a possible revision of the system of national accounts, which is the holy bible that everybody is using to calculate GDP around the world. And it was quite clear that the system uh, uh, established in 1993 was not able to take into account dimensions like research. Because you may know that uh, the costs for uh, research and development today in the system of national account is an intermediate cost. It's not an investment. So if you increase that level of expenditure, you reduce the GDP, you doesn't increase it. So I took, uh, uh, not a pen, but uh, the computer, and I wrote uh, to the other chief statisticians of the IMF, uh, World Bank, uh, uh, UN, and Eurostat, saying we have to revise the uh, system of national accounts. And they said, wait a minute, are you crazy? We adopted that uh, uh, just uh, eight years ago, nine years ago, we are not yet implementing it and you want to change it? What are you talking about? And you know that in Europe, uh, the level of GDP is used to calculate taxes, transfers from countries to the, so you're going to create a big, big mess. change, a mess. <laughs> so finally, I uh, managed to convince them. So we started in 2003, uh, the process, and uh, this led after five years to the implement or to the adoption by the UN uh, of the new 2008 system of national accounts, where, for example, there is a recommendation to include uh, uh, investment in uh, um, in uh, research and development as an investment. But then Europeans said, Europeans said, uh, well, this is very complicated. I don't want to pollute our perfect figures that we have today with this kind of uh, too advanced, because it's very complicated. We have to build a satellite account. We have to study for a few years, and then we'll see. And in fact, uh, they were able also to put some wording in the system of national accounts of caution. Of, and uh, in fact, in my intervention at the UN Statistical Commission in 2009, when this final product was adopted, I said to me, to, to everybody, not to me, uh, I said to everybody, this is the saddest day as chief statistician in my life because the most advanced statistical countries are slowing down the innovation. While developing countries, although they knew that they couldn't in the past implement the standards decided by developed countries, they never tried to do that. They were open to, to move forward, knowing that maybe this could take 10 years or whatever, but they never tried to stop that. So the fact that Europeans were blocking that change was really sad to me. But why am I mentioning that? Because we are talking about very, very complicated stuff. Uh, that maybe will take years to, to be implemented. And uh, therefore, uh, we have also to think about alternatives, possible alternatives. Now, let me uh, go um, in, in discussing uh, the idea of how to measure the different forms of capital. Actually, in uh, trying to measure sustainable development, which is a great concept, but very difficult to, to define because it's about the possibility of satisfying our, the needs of the current generation, leaving the possibility to do the same for the future generation. We identified at uh, international level four forms of capital that we have to try to preserve. 
One is the physical capital, tables, machines, whatever, the produced capital. Natural capital, which is about the environment. Human capital and the social capital. These are the four forms of capital that we should try to keep in mind when we talk about uh, measuring uh, well-being, sustainable development, and so on and so forth. So of course, produce capital, we measure it. Normally, we can improve uh, the way in which we uh, calculate it, but it's clear, almost clear. Of course, as you said, as soon as you move from the produced physical data to the tertiary economy, measuring is, uh, is very, very complicated and gets more and more complicated. But at least conceptually, we know how we should do it. So I'm not going to enter into that. Natural capital, we did a lot of uh, improvements measuring uh, the stock of natural resources, then when you want to transform this into money, to add or to subtract from GDP, you get in trouble because you need the shadow prices. And it's very complicated to do that. Think, for example, what is the value of losing a particular piece of butterfly? Of course, it's something relevant for the so-called biodiversity, but what should be the price that you attach to that? Almost impossible to, to assign. Of course, economists who normally do impossible things uh, found also a way to try to ask people to estimate the cost. And the, so there are good ideas on how to do that. But uh, the risk is really to pollute a more solid figure with something that is very arbitrary. And this would not be a good service for international comparability, for example. Social capital, the most complicated side of it. Um, although we saw with the crisis what trust, when oh, actually the absence of trust may create, and still now with the credit crunch and so on. So but I'm not going to enter into the social capital. Let's talk about human capital. That is what you are talking about, if I will understood. Now, human capital is uh, done by two elements. First, the number of people. And second, how much they know. Is the quantity of knowledge that is embedded in each person. Now, we have uh, actually two main ways of measuring human capital. The first one has been developed by Dale Jorgensen and Barbara Fraumeni in the uh, uh, US. When I was still chief statistician of the OECD, we launched a project that is going on uh, with several uh, volunteer countries that try to apply this model, which is very complicated. We developed a simplified way to do that. And uh, there are now several countries that are doing that. And this kind of estimates show that the share of uh, human, the ratio between human capital and GDP is at least seven, eight times the ratio between physical capital and GDP. So it's something that is very important, of course. Jorgensen and Fraumeni proposed to calculate the human capital looking at uh, the salaries and wages that people earn during their life as a measure of, uh, the, uh, of the yield in a sense, of the result of what you know. Of course, there are very big uh, hypotheses underlining this. But what is important to mention here is that not the entire knowledge is embedded or is uh, made clear through money. 
So there is a second alternative to try to measure human capital, which is uh, through surveys like those that the OECD has been carrying out uh, since year 2000, like PISA, the survey on 15 years old uh, uh, people asking them uh, uh, a lot of questions through which you can derive uh, these rankings, uh, where, for example, uh, Finland and uh, Korea are very high and others are lower. And now, the survey is carried out uh, in several countries covering almost 90% of the world GDP. And now, OECD has expanded PIA, uh, PISA to PIAC which is the same approach for adults, 50, not just 50 years old people, uh, the cohort of 50 years old as we were thinking when we started, but for the rest of the population. And that is extremely important because PIAC is trying to measure people's capacity of living in the world where they are living. For example, using computers, understanding uh, uh, how to interpret text, reading, uh, mathematics, not only, but really the capacity of being part of a society. The results will be available uh, in 2013, and that is a good way to do because it's trying to measure the stock. While the Jorgensen from many rebuilds the stock looking at the flows of income. In this case, you try to measure the real stock. But then, how can you transform this into money is still an open question. This is why, in, at this uh, conference of the UN uh, that I'm chairing, now uh, we are trying to make a step forward saying, Okay, let's suppose that we have the PIAC results. What are we going to do with that? So as you can see, and I stop here uh, looking into these um, very complicated uh, measurement issues, is a very, very difficult story. So I'm very curious, I would be very curious to know more about what you are doing in concrete terms. And maybe we can have exchanges and try to present uh, um, elsewhere where what you are doing. And eventually at the uh, 2012 conference in, in Delhi, it would be interesting to, to know uh, if you have results. But let me conclude uh, with three elements that in my view are particularly important. First, who is building? knowledge. Where is knowledge built? In the national accounts, we distinguish between uh, different uh, institutional sectors, the public administration, uh, the uh, enterprises, the households, rest of the world, and so on, the classical uh, five or six uh, uh, sectors. L let me use that. Of course, the public sector builds knowledge through the schooling system, not only, but mainly through the formal education system. The uh, household sector is building this through investments, is paying, sorry, in many cases is paying uh, for additional um, knowledge services that are provided by the private sector, for example, private schools. And then, of course, it integrates our knowledge through the informal training on the job in living in our households. And then enterprises. That is, in my view, the most uh, challenging uh, change that policies need to promote. Because in many cases, in most cases I would say, knowledge doesn't go through just training on the job, or formal training, but through doing, 
things together. And as you said, uh, the new technologies allow everybody to teach everybody or learn from everybody. Today is the birthday of the World Wide Web. And in fact, uh, the, um, the creator of the World Wide Web is in Rome, is doing a conference. I, I, I was born in June, so I'm a Gemini. There are two of me, but I couldn't be in two places at the same time, so I'm here and I'm glad to be here. But the others <laughs> are celebrating the birthday of the World Wide Web in other conference in Rome. So how can we measure that kind of knowledge? I have no idea. But I would like to stress one point important for you, I hope. This movement that we have created at macro level around the world with this Stiglitz Commission, the OECD project, and all these activities, now is mirrored by initiatives at micro level, at enterprise level, but what is called the initiatives like the Global Reporting Initiative, GRI, or the ILO, the International Labor Office Initiative, on decent work. So it's interesting that now companies are looking into the way in which they contribute to the overall well-being of their communities and knowledge should be put at the core of this. It's not just knowledge for their workers, but overall is a corporate social responsibility to improve knowledge of the community. Which of course is the opposite of what they normally do, because when they discover something, they keep it for themselves, trying to make money out of it. So that is, is a nice story to, to try to develop. And uh, um, my last point, which is uh, uh, provocation, if you wish. As we know very well around the world, uh, the, the share of profits on the total GDP is at the highest level ever. In developed countries, uh, maybe this is due to the fact that uh, some policies were adopted. I'm not going to enter into that. My question, my provoking question is, is there any correlation between the fact that the profits share at the, the top level and the fact that enterprises invested so much in the information economy? Investing so much in how to use the information, there are making money out of it, while the rest of, of the society is a sort of slave of this imbalanced knowledge. And so this is why companies are able to take out of this surplus, if you wish, which is based on the asymmetric knowledge. So it's just to say that it's very nice to talk about uh, all this stuff, but there is money behind that. And I'm not sure that companies are really open or ready to share this money with the rest of the society. Thank you. Uh, uh.